first what I wanted to do is just, this talk is about basically uh, being able to compare various hardware platforms. And so instead of talking today about IonQ's hardware, instead we're actually at a point now where you can actually, as end users, actually do your own comparison. So what I'm going to do is to try to help you, <coughs> teach you how to do your own comparisons so you can make up your own minds instead of me coming up here and trying to sell you on IonQ's hardware. So <coughs> to that end, if, if you were going to buy a new car, there would be a sticker on the back of the window that would tell you about that particular car. And you could use that sticker to compare it with other models of that particular manufacturer or even other manufacturers. That sticker is actually required by law in the United States to sell a new car. And that sticker would have information, obviously, things about what the miles per gallon, what the expected uh, maintenance cost would be, and then whether or not you could have chrome wheels and air conditioning and number of cylinders and a number of things like that. Obvious problem is today is that for quantum computing, we don't have such a thing. We need a quantum sticker that we can put on quantum computers so that all of you can compare these quantum machines. And until we get one of those things, is you're going to have to do that work yourself. Strange thing is we have this for refrigerators, we have it for microwaves, we have it for dishwashers, we have it for washer dryers, we just don't yet have it for uh, quantum computers. So this talk is really to tell you about how you could actually do that same kind of work yourself, and luckily it's relatively easy to do. So, um, <coughs> the good news is that just recently you've probably seen two major announcements about different cloud vendors which are making uh, quantum computers easily available to just about everyone. Um, now, with a simple change, you can switch to run your particular application on multiple different kinds of hardware. In fact, actually, if you were here with Julie's conversation this morning, is she did it live in front of you. She so switched between a quantum simulator to IonQ's hardware actually while she was standing up here. And it kind of shows you how easy this is actually to do. So in the future, what you want to do here is to do this yourself. It's really easy to do. Even apparently, Microsoft product managers can do it themselves. So all of you could be able to do it too. So all you need is a uh, Azure account or an AWS account to be able to do this. There is no special permission. You don't need to talk to INQ. You don't need to talk to any of the other vendors. All you need is one of these cloud accounts, and you can go do it yourself. Um, and if you're working from a garage in a little two-person startup, or if you're from the world's largest uh, corporation, we've democratized the access to quantum hardware. You all have equal access to the hardware. There's nothing special that's required. There's no advantage. Um, okay. So you as a consumer are likely to have a tough time to figure out what's true given all of the various claims and hype in quantum computing. Um, I'll tell you a little story that I hear all the time from potential investors. Investors say, we've talked to every hardware company out there, and you probably actually heard this today from various hardware companies, that their particular hardware is the best hardware, and everyone else's hardware sucks. We say the same thing about everyone else, too. <laughs> so <clears throat> we don't take it personally when they say it to, about us, either. Um, but the good news is we can cut through all that now. We can actually figure it out, because you can actually run it yourself. So if a, if a VC that has basically infinite resources and has access to some of the brightest people in the world have a tough time figuring out who to invest, then the question is, is what can you do with probably your limited resources to figure it out? And the answer is, go to these cloud vendors and run it on everyone's hardware and see whether or not it works. Don't listen to shiny um, qubit salesmen who are trying to sell you fancy hardware. Just go give it a try. 
Okay, so one of the problems here is that uh, there's a, what I would call the art of lying by telling small truths that give a picture at the end which is actually misleading. And I have an example of that here, um, which talks about what is the fastest production car ever built. Does anyone know? Anyone have an opinion as to what the fastest production car might be? Good. <laughs> Zero. That's, I like that. Um, so up to the introduction of a Tesla, uh, the surprising answer was the VW Beetle. Turns out, zero to three, this thing cannot be beat. It's the fastest production car on the planet. No one can beat this, okay? It's a stat which is true, but it's totally misleading. And quantum has this problem all over the place, right? So if you're looking for a sports car, I don't think this is the thing that you want to, to do. And what you really want to do is get in one of these cars and give it a try. We all know statistics is the art of lying, so you've probably been hearing lots of them today. Okay, so what do you want in terms of your device? Um, what should you look for in your quantum computer? You need identical qubits, stable qubits with low errors. For n qubits, you need n squared gates with high fidelity. With low qubit counts, you need lots of connectivity between the qubits. Best if every qubit can talk to every other qubit and all qubits at the same time. And as the system scales up, the error rate should go down. If it doesn't do these things, then you're probably not having the right hardware. So how do you compare quantum computers? There's many, many ways to do this. And there's been lots of suggestions already. Um, one which you see in the press all the time, it's very natural, which is you can look at the number of qubits. But if you have lots of qubits with a limited number of operations, that's probably not very useful. You can look at fidelity. But if you have just two qubits and lots of operations and also high fidelity, that's also probably not particularly useful to you. So be careful of salesmen which are coming around and trying to just sell you on one of these particular items. There's the third thing, which is synthetic uh, metrics, which is a combination of the other two. And so this is trying to get to a little bit more honest answer. And these are things like IBM's uh, quantum volume. The one that we like is actually algorithmic. And the reason is, is that for the same reason that classical uses an algorithmic benchmark, is that this is trying to represent what it is that you're actually going to do in terms of the applications that you want to run. And so it's supposed to be representative of those kinds of applications. And so luckily, it's relatively easy to do an algorithmic benchmark. And that's what we're going to do today. OK? So for classical computers, uh, we give them well-known algorithms or sets of algorithms to run, like Linpack and Whetstones. And we see how well they perform. We run it thousands of times, and then we look at the time that it takes to run those, and that generates the data that allows us to compare various systems. However, for quantum computers, with these noisy near-term quantum computers, it's less about how fast we can run them, but more about the ability to do the problem correctly, or even if you can do them at all. So we run the algorithm a thousand times, and then we see what the results are and see if we get the right answer. So it's a different way of doing these kinds of benchmarks compared to classical. There are many algorithms that could be used for this purpose. Um, one of our favorites is Bernstein Vazrani. Uh, this was developed by Ethan Bernstein and Umesh Vazrani in the early 90s. We heard from Umesh, I believe, the, earlier this morning. So this one, one of the things I like about it is that it's easy to modify this particular uh, benchmark based on the number of qubits that you have. And the thing is so simple, basically anyone can do it. 
But I thought I'd actually rather, you know, one of the problems we have in the quantum world is we talk about various things which no one can understand. And so I thought I'd just sit down and explain what the hell this particular benchmark is actually doing so you could actually understand it. <coughs> okay. Um, for, for a benchmarking circuit, I'm sorry. Uh, this algorithm has a simple goal of finding the hidden bit string included in a black box function called an oracle. For a classical computer, finding out the hidden bit string works like a game of 20 questions. The computer has to ask the oracle about the bit string one bit at a time, as you can see in this particular animation. But on a quantum computer, we can use the device's unique computational abilities to determine the entire bit string, effectively asking all at one time. So it's relatively easy to do. It's something that all of you should be able to do. And in fact, actually, Julie, today, I believe one of the, she was doing a different benchmark, which was hidden shift. But these things are relatively easy to do, and now you can do them too. So just about the, the benchmark itself. For a benchmarking uh, circuit, the string isn't actually a mystery. We actually encode it using a series of entangling gates and an extra qubit called an ancilla. You want to run it across a wide range of circuits, and unless you have two qubit gates which are perfect, the more entangling gates that you add, the lower your overall algorithmic performance should be. So you want to run this a bunch of times, not just for the same circuit, but create a bunch of different circuits and run that. And so we typically run through, you know, maybe 100,000 different circuits to be able to see how the performance of our system actually works. So I'm going to show you the results on an IONQ computer, but I want to explain what the graph actually means so that you understand it and so that you can also create your own. Um, okay. So if you, if you had perfect circuits, uh, perfect gates, what you would see as you run it is that there would be an absolutely horizontal line running across. And that would show that a perfect result. However, in the real world, with the noisy systems that we have today, this is actually the results that you would actually see. And this is actually the data that we run on an IONQ computer. And this is now showing for 20 qubits. OK, so that you can see the particular benchmark. And so we'll publish the circuit for this. You should be able to modify it easily and be able to run it on your favorite hardware and see how it does. Right? And then you can compare that with this and then see what you think. You'll be able to compare this yourself, and then you can become a salesman to say, this is your favorite hardware. Um, OK. So one of the things that I like about this particular benchmark is that by mapping it to native gates and topologies, this algorithmic benchmark and ones like it, like the hidden shift, can be performed on any hardware, superconducting, photonic, neutral atoms, trapped ions, and even something more exotic. It can be run on anything. And it can be run for any number of qubits. So it's something that everyone should be able to do. Um, and it's something that you should start demanding from vendors to do so that you don't actually have to do it yourself. Um, one of the most important aspects of BV, and most good uh, candidates for algorithmic benchmarking, is the ability to entangle any pair of qubits within the system. Being able to efficiently entangle any or all of your qubits is the only way to fully express the power of the quantum computer for a given size, whether that be 10 or 100 qubits. This is where the all-to-all -all connectivity 
of ion Q's trapped ion technology shines. With more limited lattice topologies, nearest neighbors, entangling arbitrary uh, pairs requires an increasing number of swaps. For us, it's always as simple as picking two qubits and running the appropriate entangling gate. And what you can see from this graph here, <coughs> little dots are the qubits, and the lines are just showing you all the possible connections that an individual qubit can talk to any other qubit. In fact, actually, every qubit can talk to any other qubit and can talk to all the qubits at the same time. In fact, all qubits can talk to all qubits at the same time if you really wanted to. There is no wires in an ion trap. Instead, what we do at runtime is we use lasers to connect qubits together. So you can, you can create the perfect topology for a particular problem set. Now, if I was to compare this with um, semiconductor approach, you should see that they can only talk to their nearest neighbor usually. And so if the top qubit wanted to talk to the bottom qubit, then that would require three swaps in this particular case. <clears throat> That's a problem because I think, as you heard before, swaps are the most noisy thing you can possibly do in a quantum computer. So you don't want to do those. And this, this has the advantage that you don't have to. And as you add qubits, and this is what this little animation is doing right now, then the connectivity gets better in our case and worse in the other guys. So now you're starting to see all the possible co uh, connections. And this is only with a handful of qubits. As you start to increase the number of qubits, this goes up and up. And you know, one of the advantages to this technology also is that the um, hardware is, is reconfigurable for any particular application. So in this other things, what you would really probably expect is that over time, they would have to change their hardware topology for particular applications so that they could configure it so that it had the connectivity you'd need for a particular application. Or what you would need is to get to millions of qubits so you could start to throw away so many for so many swaps, right? So there's a huge advantage here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we think it's important for people to understand how the benchmark works. Hopefully we've given you that information today. Um, we encourage you, if you haven't already, go out and create an AWS or Azure account and actually go give it a try. We'll publish the uh, BV and hidden shift so that you can do it yourself. And we encourage you to do it on as much hardware as you can and form your own opinions. Don't listen to me. Go do it yourself. Um, with the introduction of cloud vendors and easy access to quantum hardware, we really are entering a new era. Um, I think you probably everyone can kind of sense that, that with this new introduction, that quantum is probably here. But I think there's another era that we're entering as well. And I, I'm going to call it the error of battle bots for quantum computers. Up to this point, we really haven't, it hasn't been easy to be able to compare them. And so now what we're going to see, instead of spinning blades and flamethrowers, is we're going to see in the quantum arena that various companies actually having to run real applications and compare them. And then presumably the best ones will win, and the ones which can't compete will go to the junkyard. So, uh, you know, now is that time. You've seen the announcements with the cloud vendors. I'm sure other companies will coming onto the cloud as well, and it will be easy for you to actually compare these pieces of equipment and make your own decisions. So, let the best hardware win. We hope it's INQ, but we look forward to the competition. Um, lastly, I'm going to close, and I just wanted to talk about four top misconceptions that I've heard so far in my short time in quantum computing. So number one, you need a dilution refrigerator to build a quantum computer. I hear that all the time. We run at room temperature. We have nothing which is, is you know, less than 65 degrees, unless it's a hot day outside. So don't need a dilution refrigerator. Uh, quantum computing needs a breakthrough in fundamental physics or material science to be useful. 
Our quantum computers are built with off-the-shelf parts. I like to joke um, that almost all the parts are delivered by Amazon. So uh, there's, there's no fundamental physics which are required to, to build one of these things, at least what we're doing. Uh, I guess what we're doing is relatively boring in comparison. Um, okay, and this is one of my favorite ones. I see this all the time. To do anything useful, you need millions of qubits. I hear this all the time. Um, I assume when people are saying that is that what they really mean is that they think that the error correction that's going to be needed for their particular hardware is something like 100,000 to 1 for error correction. Um, and I guess, you know, because I think that everyone pretty much agrees that somewhere in the range, you know, the previous speaker said 50, but I think probably in 100 to 150 logical qubits, you can actually start to do things which are actually really interesting. And so, um, so the discussion about a million qubits must be for hardware that needs error correction. And so what they did is they applied 100,000 times 100 to be able to get to that estimate. And so there's a misconception about that. And then where the misconception is, is that the amount of error correction that you actually need depends on the error rate. So if your error sucks, right, then you need a lot of qubits to be able to correct for it. But if the error is actually not that bad, then it turns out that the error correction is not, the, the overhead is not that high. And in fact, actually at INQ, we've calculated the error overhead is probably somewhere in the 10 to 14 qubits per qubit to get to a logical qubit. And the error rate today is good enough so that you could get to several hundred qubits before the error would actually bother you. So you're going to be well into the range of 100 to 150 qubits to do interesting things before you'll even need error correction. So this conversation that, that talks about you need millions of, of qubits to do something interesting, I wish people would just put a little thing on the end of that that says, with our hardware, you will need <laughs> millions of qubits to do anything interesting. But I think at INQ, you'll see that actually with 150 qubits, you can do lots of interesting things. The last one, which is, is one which I think is the most surprising to people, and uh, you hear it all the time, is how long it will take to get to useful quantum computing. You know, and certainly if you took the last thing, you said, okay, if I'm a, as I'm a press person and I hear that, um, I need millions of qubits, and then you say Google has a 72 qubit chip, well, that must be years and years and years away, right? Matter of fact, I shouldn't even bother thinking about this. But you have to reset yourself. What happens if it's actually 100 or 150 qubits? And then how soon will it be? And I think quantum computing is actually gonna be here a lot faster than anyone can possibly imagine. And so we're not talking decades anymore. We're not talking 10 years. We're talking more in the kind of things which would be more like months. So uh, it's, not, it's not a long, long time away. It's going to be here sooner than anyone possibly thinks. So I, these are my four top misconceptions. Not really part of my presentation, but I actually kind of got annoyed after hearing it several times. So I just decided I'd see if I could correct it. Um, please don't spread these, these mistruths if you can. If anyone is in the press, if you could correct yourself right now, that would be awesome. So thank you, and I'll take questions. Can you say anything about the characteristics of the device that's available in the cloud from Microsoft and Amazon? So, number um, of qubits, fidelities, this kind of thing. Those kinds of things. Yeah, we're um, going to make a separate announcement about the hardware uh, coming up shortly. So we're not going to be announcing it today. But if in Microsoft and in AWS is that through the private beta, um, you have to sign something and then you can get that information.
I, I think an, an obvious question after your last uh, comment here is uh, when will you have 150 qubits available? Uh, that's a, um, you know, I've, I've been told I'm not allowed to answer that question. So um, all I'm going to say is, you know, at INQ at the moment, we are, um, we're working on three generations of, of hardware at the moment, right? So we're now working on the, we're just finishing up the current generation. We're actually working on the next, we have teams which are working on the next generation, and we have teams which have started working on the generation after. And so I think within those kinds of generations, you'll see those kinds of numbers that are showing up, that should show up at its sufficient fidelity that none of these things will matter kind of going forward. In the benchmark that you showed, actually what you are doing is only fidelity of a single algorithm. Why do you don't use fidelity of the general unitaries that you can build? So like you're only benchmarking on us one specific problem instead of universal problem. So like I cannot verify my quantum device based on a single problem case. Well, I, I actually I'm not, we think that you could use this particular algorithm but now that you have access to lots of different hardware, please. I mean, you saw from Julie how easy it is to, to change the, to run on different hardware. Use whatever benchmark that you want yes, to be able is, to run it. But this is not the idea of the benchmark. Benchmark should tell you about the performance, general performance of a device. Here I know the performance only on a single particular algorithm. Okay, I can select a suite of algorithms, but still this doesn't give me information about performance of a device, of and a uh, universal device, because I, I will have uh, information about the uh, performance of, let's say, one trick pony. I want to have uh, information about universality of your device. And from single algorithms, how many you want to pick, I will not be able to verify how your uh, device is performing. Maybe Chris, can you help on that one? Or Zheng Seng? But I, I, think, I think it's a fantastic question. So that's why if you look at uh, classical high performance computing, and if you look at Limpact benchmark, for example, it is actually many dozens of different types of problems that represent a use case. Right? So I think over time, this is, we, we talked about one today, but I think the, uh, the industry will actually continue to add, depending on the nature of the problems that, they, that you guys want to use, uh, we'll, we'll pick um, a very large number, over time, a growing number of representative algorithms to, to actually reflect the use case. So in that case, this is one of the very many that we want to. Okay. To do. And at the, you know, to be honest, at the end of the day, what we'd love for the industry to have is many, many benchmarks and to be able to run it on hardware and then to see if it works. So. Um, you know, we're all in, if, you know, we, I guess we, we think that it's going to work on our hardware, so we encourage as many benchmarks as you possibly want to run and, and get your own, own um, you know, opinion as to the hardware and, and what its capabilities are. And presumably, um, you know, there will be uh, groups of individuals, maybe an industry association, that will come up with some sort of benchmark that will become the standard, will become the future Linpack for quantum. Um, we don't think, by the way, that we should create that because we're, we have a bias to it. So we do think that there needs to be a, a neutral third party that probably comes up with the benchmark and applies it and actually runs it for all, all, various, all the various companies, right? Because we need it to be honest as much as we can. <laughs> <laughs>